This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Wow. Good morning. I'm glad to welcome you to worship today. Uh, whether you're in person here or online, we're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, we're grateful for your presence here. Your presence is a gift to us. If you have any questions about the life of First Presbyterian Church Newton, you can speak with Jody or any one of the elders. You just ask, are you an elder? <laughs> uh, let us know. We'll be glad to be of help. For those of you who are here in the sanctuary, we ask that you would sign the guest register and pass it down and then pass it back and look at the names on your row. And that way you'll have some idea if there's someone visiting and you can speak to them or maybe somebody who's been coming for a long time and you don't know them. But that way you'll know who they are and you can greet one another. There is no time for fellowship this morning because of the congregational meeting and lunch that we have after, immediately after worship. Um, and if you came and didn't remember to bring something for lunch, come anyway. There'll be enough for everybody. Uh, today I'd like to lift up Lynette for a uh, moment for mission. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Lynette Insko. I'm the current chair of Congregational Ministries, um, also known for short as CM. Um, the, our members are uh, Margie Pulliam, Johnny Legan, Sally Sigmund, Patty Nell, and Amy Lawyer. Um, so I was going to answer the question, what does Congregational Ministries offer the church? Um, we offer fellowship among congregation members. Members become friends with each other versus simply acquaintances. We, we help with building relationships. Our activities frequently involve food, along with a gathering of people to facilitate building relationships, so in a way we help feed and nurture. Adult fellowship dinners. I'd never attended one prior to joining this committee last year. They most definitely have nurtured my acquaintances into friendships. Not only are these dinners always great with great food and fellowship, they're also fun, interesting and sometimes very emotionally moving. For example, last May we did a Mother's Day theme and everyone brought a photo of their mother and a pleasantly, surprisingly large number of people got up and spoke about their mothers, their relationships with them, significance in their lives, etc. It was very moving. We also do uh, time for fellowship with refreshments. As Jody has once said, we can have time for fellowship, we, but we like it with refreshments as it keeps more people there longer, I think. Um, we have this in the narthex after worship. Uh, not only can we talk with each other, but it's a great opportunity to meet and greet and welcome visitors. We need consistent sign-ups to provide refreshments, though, for that component. Some of our upcoming events include Veterans Day reception in the narthex after worship on November 10th, and we have an adult fellowship dinner on December 5th with a Christmas theme. We'll provide more details on these events at a later date. Also on December 5th is the annual candy making event of which Suzanne has asked me to announce. It's the corner table candy making. Uh, PW Women's Ministries is inviting both men and women to help make 32 batches of peppermint bark for the corner table candy tins in our fellowship hall. No prior experience is required and there are both seated positions and standing positions. So Thursday, if December 5th, one to four, is you're making the candy. This is probably the easiest of the four candies to make, which involves breaking and melting white chocolate bark in the microwave, spreading onto parchment paper, and then breaking into pieces. We need 10 to 12 people to help with this. Friday, December 6th, is a morning time frame, and that's packing of the tins. This will involve breaking the sheets of candy into bite-sized pieces and packing the candy into 300 candy tins. This is mainly a sit-down job. If you have any questions or anything or need information about sign-ups, contact the Office of the Church or Suzanne Reinhardt. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Am I on? There we go. It's good to see you. Um, and welcome to our online folks again. We're so glad you've joined us for worship as well. It's so nice to have everybody here and there um, and worship together. So um, you can probably tell my, my voice I have a cold, so I'm keeping my distance or covering my face, doing those kind of things. I still like you. I like you enough to keep my distance from you. 
So um, anyway, we're, we're getting there. And I also want to um, lift up again this congregational conversation this, after, this morning after this service. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a little walk down memory lane, actually. And if you have been around for a while, we need your memories. And if you're newer, we need you to, you, this is your chance to catch up on the life of this church and kind of get a sense of the church that you became a part of. Today's theme is fellowship. You'll hear that in the sermon in a way. It's um, connected to that. As Lynette was speaking, I was reminded of um, something um, a preacher in Montreat said this summer. She has, a, she has a, um, a pillow in her study that says, Jesus takes naps, so I t- want to be like Jesus. <laughs> you know, I could say Jesus liked eating. If you noticed in the scriptures, Jesus eats a lot. He eats in family. They, the Last Supper is the most famous of the eating. Jesus ate a lot. So I want to be like Jesus. I eat a lot. I eat at fellowship time. I think it's a wonderful thing to gather together for fellowship. So we have a chance right after worship to do that. A couple of um, weeks from now, we have a congregational meeting. We are, I'm excited that you are going to be ready to elect your pastoral nominating committee, a.k.a. PNC. Say that with me. PNC. Because we are not going to say pastoral nominating committee a lot. We're going to say PNC and also members to the session. So we um, want to make sure you're aware of that. And I do want to lift up because it's fellowship day, the sign up for the time for fellowship. That time is so important that we gather and spend just a few minutes together following worship and catch up with each other. And it's also a chance to greet our visitors who are part of our life together. So there are many other things going on in the life of the church, but the most important thing at this moment is the worship. So let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. We come from scattered lives to this sanctuary to seek our unity in the spirit, to seek the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, seek the peace of God, our creator. God's people have gathered. Let us worship God together and join me in prayer. Eternal God, You have called us together to remind us of who we are and whose we are. In this time set apart for you, we offer you our praise. But we are not the only ones. All around the world, people are praising you. Help us to join in the great chorus of praise so together we might show that we are one in the Spirit and so bring you honor and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Before we move to the prayer of confession, I forgot one important announcement. We are taking a group photo at the end of this service for Guatemala. Doug and Mimi are going to Guatemala and we, they want a picture and we're going, and actually we might even put this on Facebook, so just be aware. We want a group picture. So during the postlude, I invite you to kind of gather in the middle. I'm going to take the picture from up here. So we look down and they get to see our sanctuary in Guatemala. It should be a beautiful picture. So at the postlude, I'm sorry, Brandon, as you're playing the postlude, we're just going to kind of gather in here and we'll um, be ready to take that picture right after the end of the postlude. I apologize for interrupting worship for that commercial, but um, that's an important one. We return to worship remembering that God, that Jesus said, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am meek and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So knowing we can come to one who gives us rest, let us confess our sins together before God. God of mercy, God of love, in humbleness of heart, we confess our sins. We forget to love and serve you and wander from your ways. We are careless for your world and put its life in danger. We talk of our concern for others, but fail to match our words with action. Merciful God, forgive us our sins and bring us back into a good and right relationship with you and one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Friends, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, so I can declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the God of all mercy who forgives us all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. And since we've been offered the peace of God through Jesus Christ, let us share that peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to show signs of God's peace. This is mine to you today. <laughs> Please be seated. 
So it seems to me today is a good day to pray for our friends in Guatemala for peace because Doug and Michael are getting ready to head to Guatemala Friday? A week. A week from Friday. Well, it's maybe too early to pray for them, but we're going to pray for them anyway. <laughs> All right. So I think we focused on our hurricanes enough for the moment. Keep praying for the hurricanes. But let's just remember there's a world of suffering out there and struggle. And um, maybe we got a taste of what the world suffers every day at the same time. But as we prepare for y'all to go, we may say more next week, but we want to pray for y'all and our friend, brothers and sisters in Guatemala, not only our partners, churches, but wherever they may be in Guatemala and any third world country as they just struggle for survival. I've been to enough mission trips to know that um, I've experienced what I forgot sometimes. The power of a flush toilet is not to be underestimated. <laughs> Things like that are ways that people live all the time, all around the world. There's no recovery crew coming to fix their toilets. But they live in that way. But we go and be in partner and say, you're not alone. That God is with you and we're with you. So let's pray for our brothers and sisters in Guatemala and other places in this world. Lord God, we thank you that indeed we do have brothers and sisters across the world. And we especially pray for those that we know in Guatemala. And we thank you for Doug and Mimi and the other team from Western North Carolina planning their trip even now. And we pray that that may be a time of peace for them as they come to be in community together. We thank you for reminders of this, that we're not alone in this world, that we are with each other and that you provide us shelter and you provide us nurture and you provide us peace. So bring peace to that place and to every troubled place in this world. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, you know us better than we know ourselves. As the scriptures are read, we will listen for your voice. By your spirit, lead us out of our fears and into the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of our souls. Amen. Today's reading is from Psalm 91, 1 through 6, and 14 through 16. And it can be found in your pew Bible on page 548 in the Old Testament section. One of my favorite passages. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the hunter and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and defense. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in the darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. The word of the Lord.
God's people say amen. amen. Golly, people, wake up. All right. Well, I don't get to say this because Laurie is, is usually following you. I love this choir, and I love that's one of my favorite songs of the last 20 years since I left you. It just always moves me as I hear that. And um, I was singing along. I'm sorry for the people online that I was singing along, but I was singing along. So it's time to invite our children down for our time together as we welcome them with sanctuary. Sit down. Why don't y'all sit over there? We're sit there. There's a reason for that. All right. So good morning. It's so good to be with you today. Laura usually gets to do this. Guess where Laura and her family are? Disney World, the Magic Kingdom. Well, we're in the Magic Kingdom of God right here, I'm here to tell you. Yeah, so we don't need to go to Orlando to be in a Magic Kingdom. We're right here. But I want to show with you a picture that I found in a corner of a room. And it's a picture I gave to this church when I left. And y'all put it in the corner of a room. <laughs> What's up with that? Well, to be fair, I didn't write anything on the back of the picture saying it was for me, so it just kind of got forgotten. That's all right, but I want to share it with you because it's a picture of the Last Supper, and it's a very unusual picture because usually when you see a picture of the Last Supper, all you see is Jesus and a bunch of men. So what do you see in this picture that's more than Jesus and a bunch of men? You see children? Do you see the children? This is a picture of the Last Supper thinking it was the families of the disciples that came and gathered with Jesus. And it makes sense to me. If you're going to have a last meal, why not have the families present? And so I, I picked this up in Colorado, believe it or not, years ago. And it reminds me the church is a family where we gather and care for one another. But guess what? You don't have to look at this picture to see that. Look at that picture up there. Do you see that picture with all the children in it? That's our Last Supper picture here. And what I love about that picture and that stained glass window is we got children, we got people of all races and ethnicities, that God's family is a big family. 
And we all come to God to be cared for and nurtured and we care for one another. And Jesus is the head of our family. So we listen to Jesus as Jesus says things like, love one another as I've loved you. And care for one another as I've cared for you. So today I want you to think about that. When you come in on Sunday and you get bored by the sermon or whatever we're doing, that's what I used to do, frankly. When I was growing up in the church, I'd look at the stained glass windows. It's okay to look there and see the faces of people that are meant to be people like you. So we give thanks to God for our family today. Let's have a word of prayer. God, we thank you that this is a church home and a church family where we can receive care and love by so many people. And we experience your care and love through them. And for that, we are grateful. Amen. You can go to the back or wherever you're supposed to go. Laura usually knows where that is. I think you know where that is. <coughs> Um, please join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you've gathered us as a family to listen to you, the head of the family. We thank you for the word that you give us that through the Holy Spirit still speaks to us even today. So by your spirit, may these ancient words be current words that speak to our hearts. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So today we are early in the book of Acts. We just, in the story, the Holy Spirit's just been given to the church and it's a powerful um, part of that Pentecost message we've shared at Pentecost Sunday. And then we get this glimpse early on into the life of the Christian community and it comes to us from Acts chapter two. Let's listen to God's word. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and their prayers Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the needs to all as any had need. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to the number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This week, I think it was on Monday, I was meeting with the new member committee. It's a, re, we're rebooting that effort because there's a great concern here. Frankly, it's a great concern in every mainline church about the loss of members. The, all mainline churches have suffered this kind of loss. Alongside that, there is a desire to grow, that fear of loss, but there's always a desire to grow. Churches are always worried about growth. When I was in Little Rock doing their interim, they, were, they thought they were 1,900 members. They were 1,200 members. And they kept saying, well, we're just kind of afraid. You're at 1,200 members, you're afraid? They were losing members and they knew it. So every, it doesn't matter what size you are, you're worried about growth. At the Kirk, we were a growing church, but it, they, they became this kind of paranoia and said, well, that could change any time. So we better be worried about growth, especially in the secular world. So wanting to grow is really just a common concern that I think most churches face, frankly, faced all of my ministry. But my question is this, why? Why do we want to grow? Is it fear that our church will die if we don't grow? Honestly, that is the most common reason I hear. But is fear really the reason to grow a church? Not to mention, most people don't want to join a church to help it survive. I remember telling the folks at Second Church Little Rock, they were saying, well, we have to survive. I said, I hate to break it to you, but nobody really cares if you survive if they're a visitor. That's not why they're here, to help you survive. I've never heard one person at the Kirk say to me, you know, I joined the Kirk so I could help you survive. Well, no, that's not why people come to church. When we look at the great ends of the church, not one, not one says anything like this. The reason the church exists 
is in order to survive. Instead, I think today's great end tells us why we should want to grow a church. So it's so that we can do this. We can provide shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship for the children of God. And anyone who's ever been born in the world is a child of God. Remember that from Logos? I'm a child of God, you are a child of God, we will treat each other that way. That's true for the whole world. And we have something special to offer to God's children. That's what that second end reminds us of. So yes, I do want this church and every church to grow because I think this is a great gift we have to offer people in our world today. As our new member committee was meeting, we were talking about what a warm and friendly congregation this is, and it is. It's one of the warmest out there, and we need to get that word out. One of the members in the meeting said, uh, said we need to answer this question. Why? Why would people come to First Presbyterian Church? Why would they come here? Well, I think that's a great question. How would you answer it if you were in a little small group, that question? Well, that all got me thinking this week. Those committees have a way of getting me thinking. They got me thinking about the very personal challenges facing people these days. Now, I've already shared with you what I've learned from working with the youth at the Montreat Youth Conference, that they're struggling with depression, mental health issues, feeling safe, being bullied, spiritual issues. But the truth is, that's not a youth problem. That's a human being problem. I remember about a year ago, the Surgeon General of the United States declared that we are facing an epidemic. And he wasn't talking about cancer. He wasn't talking about a resurgence of COVID. He was talking about the epidemic of loneliness, isolation, loss of connection. Isn't it interesting that while we are the most digitally connected people who have ever existed in the history of the world, there's still so much loneliness, depression, personal isolation. Isn't it interesting that as the church and other faith communities have declined, those personal issues have risen? Could it be that we in the church have something special to offer people in a world like ours, like shelter, nurture, spiritual fellowship? Do we know how important it is that we nurture those things in the church, that the fellowship events that Lynette was talking about are not just nice events to come to. They are crucial to invite people into a community of care and love. We should come because we want to increase the care and love for one another and welcome the visitors who come here to that kind of care and love. Do we understand that vital worship and study groups and friendships and care may be exactly what people are hungering for in this world? So the reason I want this church or any church I'm a part of, I want them to grow is not for you to survive so others may be a part of this community where we love God and we learn that God loves us and we share that love with one another, where people are starving for love and connection in this world can find a spiritual home no matter who they are, where they are loved in a world that will never love them in the same way. You know, that's always been the best gift we've offered the world from the beginning. One reason we are learned that the early church grew so fast was because Gentiles and pagans, those outsiders, were attracted to what they saw going in, on inside the life of the Christian community, the love and care. It's really been that way from the beginning. We got that picture of it from the book <laughs> of Acts, of what this kind of community looks like. I, I just love this picture. Now, I want to be real honest with you. I hear this picture, and sometimes it seems like a painting, an idealistic picture of it, because just to be honest, you would say, Jody, but what about the Corinthians? Well, you know, they weren't perfect. But I love this picture. I think it's the aspirational picture for the church. They devoted themselves, devoted. Don't you love that word, devoted? They didn't attend. They didn't just happen to show up. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the making of bread, and prayers. This is all to say they were in it together. They were devoted to one another. They shared everything, everything. They formed significant bonds and relationship as they gathered to learn, to eat, to pray, to worship, which is all a part of the peace of the um, life of faith. I know this is true for me. 
I know my times in, with Christians in Bible study or Sunday school or some other kind of group has always made my life so much richer. I've learned so much by listening to others. I've learned so much more than simply by listening to podcasts, though I love my podcasts. It's really in the sharing together and hearing from one another that I grow the most. So when we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to prayer, to knowing each other and caring for each other, like they did in the book of Acts, it's just a beautiful thing. And according to Acts, and I believe this to be true, people are drawn to this. At least that was true in the book of Acts where we hear a report in their very secular and pluralistic world. Let's remember that was a secular and pluralistic world where the church was born. We learn that day by day the Lord added to those who were being saved. People just wanted to be a part of this kind of fellowship because they couldn't find it anywhere else. Relationships have always been at the heart of the church. I always think about how God didn't send Jesus just to give us more information. God had already done that through the prophets. We have lots of information. Though God came personally in the flesh because God wanted to be in relationship with us and to bring together people and to be in relationship with each other, to care for one another. Paul said as much to the Galatian Christians when he told them to bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ, as if basically saying, if you're fulfilling the law, if you were being righteous before God is what you're after. If you want to be please God, how about this? Don't worry about all the doctrines. Worry about caring for one another. The early church practiced this. An early church father, Tertullian, noted that Romans, non-believers, would observe the fast-growing community of Jesus' followers and exclaim, see those Christians, how they love one another. One of the most important things the church can do in our modern world is to be a place for the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of all the children of God, whether they're in church or not. That's why I've come to believe that maybe one of the most min important ministries of the church today, and maybe I wouldn't have said this 40 years ago, but today is the fellowship ministry. I hate to break it to you, Lynette, you have a very important committee. <laughs> One of the things I love about this church is that you gather after worship when we have our time for fellowship. We'll stay around out there and talk to each other. You just don't get in your car and go home. And today I'm expecting that you'll be showing up for the congregational lunch so we can talk to each other and care for one another. There's food and fellowship. That's important. If you ask me, one of the many reasons I know people will come to First Presbyterian the Church in the future is because this is a warm and caring people and they would want to be a part of that. You are a shelter and nurture and spiritual fellowship for many. You have so much to offer people in this world who are lonely or lost or carrying heavy burdens, or maybe those new to the community or simply looking for a church home. Whenever I preach on this kind of topic, I remember the story Fred Craddock told. I know I told it to you, but you don't remember my sermon, so it's okay. <laughs> it's, it's really what makes a church special. And I think it's what makes you special. I love this story. Craddock was serving a very small church in eastern Tennessee, and he says it was their custom at that church on Easter to have a baptismal service. And my church immerses, and it was held, they held a baptismal service in Watts Bar Lake on Easter evening after sundown. Now out on the sandbar, I, along with the candidates for baptism, moved into the water, and they moved across the shore where the little congregation was gathered and singing around a fire and cooking supper. It sounds like Camp Greer to me, doesn't it? Just like Camp Greer. They constructed little booths on the shore for changing clothes and they had blankets hanging. And as candidates moved from the water, they went in and they changed their clothes and they went to that campfire right at the center. And finally, last of all, I went over, changed clothes and went to the fire, says Craddock. Once we were all around the fire, the ritual was that each person in the circle gave his or her name and said this. My name is, and if you ever need someone to do washing and ironing, my name is, and if you need someone to chop wood, my name is, and if you ever need somebody to babysit, my name is, if you ever need anybody to repair your house, my name is, and if you ever need anybody to sit with the sick, 
my name is, and if you ever need a car to go to town, and Craddock says, and around the circle it went. And then we ate, then we had a square dance, again, Camp Greer-like, right? And at a time they knew, I didn't know, Percy Miller with his thumb in the bib overalls, I hate to say, Randy Miller, I have you in mind here when I have this picture. <laughs> he right. puts his thumbs in the bib overalls and he would stand up and say, it's time to go. And everybody left. And Percy lingered behind and with his big shoe, kicked sand over the dying fire. And my first experience of that, he saw me standing there still. And he looked at me and he said, Craddock, folks don't ever get any closer than this. Craddock says, in that little community, they have a name for that. I've heard it in other communities as well. In that community, the name for that is church. They call it church. I'm here to tell you, in this growing secular, pluralistic world of ours, the world needs congregations to be that kind of church. Newton, Conover, Catawba County needs First Presbyterian Church to be that kind of church. The kind of church where people come and visit you and they say, my, 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 see those Christians, how they love one another. If you want to know why I think First Presbyterian Church should grow, I can't think of a better reason. Can you? Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for the many expressions of care and fellowship and concern that flow in and out of this church literally every day. There's not a time, any day, when I don't hear about a concern and somebody wants to do something about it. We thank you that you've put the heart of care and love into the hearts of the people of this church. We pray that we may be able to share that with others and that others, as they come to us, may experience your love because they have experienced our love. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.
standing for the affirmation of faith. Christ calls us to be disciples, informing his people and sending them into the world. Jesus called individuals to be disciples. They were to share the joy of his companionship, to understand and obey his teachings, and to follow him in life and death. We confess that Christians today are called to be discipleship. Life shared with Christ and shaped by Christ is God's undeserved gift to each of us. It is also God's demand upon every one of us, never perfectly fulfilled by any of us. Forgiven by God and supported by brothers and sisters, we strive to become more faithful and effective in our daily practice of the Christian life. Amen. I do call your attention to the prayer concerns you'll find in the bulletin and the insert and ask that you would remember those folks in prayers. Um, continue to pray for our folk friends in Western North Carolina, the Southeast and Florida, from Florida with Milton to Helene up in our region. There's a lot going on. Sharon and I went back Thursday. I lose track of time. And um, Randy, the generator's working. But we got power back. Randy was helping me with a generator issue. And um, we are glad to have power back, but there's a lot of recovering. But I would tell you that churches are shifting from emergency mode to sustainability mode. There's still a lot of help out there. Now they're trying to figure out how do we keep this up for months, and they have to shift from that. <coughs> kind of, as I use the emergency room analogy, now they're moving to the hospital room. And they're all shifting. So please pray for all communities, churches, organizations. There's a big team effort going on. Uh, I want to thank um, um, Susan for bringing up the um, Suzanne for bringing up Camp Greer is doing such a great job too. We can be very proud. Let's um, join together in prayer. Generous God, we bring you our thanks to you for this life and all its blessings, for joys great and simple, for gifts and powers more than we deserve, for the assurance that your mercy knows no limit for the presence of Christ in our weakness and our strength, and for the power of Christ to transform our suffering. In darkness and light, in trouble and in joy, help us to trust your love, serve your purpose, and to praise your name. We pray for the life of your church in all the world. May every congregation be a community of love and may every baptized Christian a witness to your grace. Renew all who worship in this place, that we may be in living fellowship with your spirit, serving our community and our world in the name of Christ, sharing his love with all. We do pray for the life of the world. Teach us by the power of your love to live as members of one human family, rejecting the things that make for violence, bearing one another's burdens, working together to make a world of righteousness and peace. We pray for the life of our country. Guide those who lead us. Govern them in your faith and fear. Protect those who defend our shores and guard the peace. And Lord, we pray for those who are passing through a time of trial, through poverty, through ill health, through deep anxiety, through grief. Take from them the spirit of fear and give to them your spirit of peace and hope. We pray for those we love, our families and friends. Strengthen the love we have for them and give them all they need for their welfare and their happiness and their peace. And may we create the kind of faithful community where we provide shelter in a time of trial, where we provide fellowship for those who are lonely, and we provide spiritual food for those who are spiritually hungry. 
We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us how to pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In gratitude to the goodness of God, let us bring our tithes and offerings before God. Let us pray. God, we place our offerings in this offering plate or online and whatever way we contribute, we place them all before you because we want to be a part of your work in this world and pray that you may use them for the building of your kingdom. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
Time is coming for the picture. Follow, remember to come up to the middle at the postlude. This is not my request. It comes from Doug and Mimi Michael. And if I've learned anything, I listen to Doug and Mimi Michael. And I would suggest that you do too. So um, they want to take a gift with them to Guatemala. And you are the gift that they want to take with them. So during the postlude, come forward. We'll make it as painless as possible. OK? All right. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today and forever. Amen. Just sit down somewhere in the middle. That's all you need to do. Just find us. Just go ahead and get finding a pew. Yep, there you go. All right. Actually, if you'll sit in the pew, it'll be easier to see everybody. Yeah. Brandon, I want you in the picture too. Right? We want Brandon in the picture. Yes. There you go, squeeze together. Make sure Bill Long gets in the picture. You look good, by the way. People ask me, people ask me what's like um, coming back to Newton, and I say, you know, it's like a family reunion, and seeing you like this, it is like a family reunion. So consider this your family reunion picture. And not only is Guatemala going to see it, I'm going to save this for myself. So there you go. All right, we've got a few to take. Smile, act like you enjoy being here, all that kind of stuff. All right. And then one more camera. And this, this, this. And I'm going to do something just, I'm going to do a separate side just in case they need this on Doug's camera. Y'all are very compliant. <laughs> do you remember doing this for school when you were in elementary school? All right, we're thinking one of those will work, cropped or otherwise. And um, so anyway, thank you. I'll see you at lunch in just a minute.